can get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Urban Experience Committee meeting of Monday, March 13th. And what is important about Monday, March 13th? Happy birthday, Happy Karen. Birthday Karen. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Just means I'm getting very old. Uh, before we begin, we're going to make a slight change on the agenda. And I think, I don't know if I need a motion to move. You can do it. You're the chair. So I want to move um, number 13 on the consent items. I want to move that to the discussion yeah. items. Especially if you're doing it for me. So. Yes. <laughs> so do we need a motion? For no. You okay. Can so we're going to go ahead and move that. And I'm going to put that under the... Uh, right after the Cannon Street Shelter Amendment. Okay. Great. So everybody knows that. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, our notes, our minutes from last month passed. First up, uh, we have Steve McDonald with his monthly permit report. <clears throat> And Stephanie assisting. <laughs> Sorry about uh, Good that. afternoon. Thank you, Chair and members of the Council. So we're going to talk about the year-to-date and February numbers. Um, first up is our total permit applications. This is not just construction. We used to just come forward with construction permits, but there's other types of permits, trade permits, electrical, HVAC, uh, development permits, engineering permits. So this includes it all. And so you can see that we're up on the four-year for both um, year-to-date and for monthly. And then similarly for construction permits, um, we're up um, for the month and for the year as well. And then on multifamily, we're down for both um, year-to-date and for monthly. And if you see in 2021, there's that's kind of a anomaly that that year there was a large project that came in so uh, but but to the four-year average that we do this to we're, we're down on multifamily year-to-date and, and monthly next up is single family and so you can see there in 2023 again we're we're down compared to that four-year average and then this kind of breaks it down into a little more detail so you we have single family duplex multifamily and change of use, oftentimes when people have an ADU, there's a change of use involved. Or if there's a change of use from an office to residential, that, that category captures that. So we're at 70 units year to date on all the different types of residential that we have. And then for February, um, we've got this same breakdown um, uh, and compared to the February's four years previous. And we've added BOCA and ADUs processed, um, what, what was processed in February, so four BOCA housing units, four ADUs in February. And year to date, we have the numbers of 15 BOCA and 36 ADUs. Not since BOCA started, since we initiated that. And then housing in the pipeline is also something that I think is important to have there because it, it details um, plans that are in plan review. And so we've got over 1,500 units of housing that are in plan review currently, and an additional 2,700, over 2,700, that have come through uh, the MFTE application um, and pre-development. So these are not double counting, so that, that is what we see in the pipeline right now. And then finally, I'm happy to say uh, through a lot of hard work um, from the folks in IT that work on Excella and Stephanie and Sean. Um, in our office, we have the mapping, and so we're able to break down the permit numbers, and we, we'll be able to add more detail to this in the future, but um, this just breaks down mm -hmm. the activity year-to-date in the different council districts. You can see that um, it's fairly spread evenly, especially as it relates to the number of projects per, um, per district. And then this one breaks it down in February, where, where again, it was really evenly spread on the valuation and the number of permits there. And we can, we can add, in the future, we hope to be able to add like residential units and that type of thing to this. But this was um, not easy for everyone to do with our antiquated Excella program. So 
my hats off to Stephanie, Sean, and the IT team. And then last, we have um, largest projects uh, year to date, um, just to give you an idea, and the council district that they're in as well. So any questions? Yes. Who put the slide thing? Who put the PowerPoint together? Uh, that's Stephanie. That was fabulous. I, <laughs> especially the first slides where you have um, the numbers and overlaid under pictures. Yes. Nice. Yes. <laughs> she does a great job with that. And, and, and it's, been, it's been taking a little less time each time we do it because uh, people are working hard to be able to get new reports in Excella and work, uh, work on that. So that's, that's been great and helpful for Stephanie as well. And this is just in the weeds, but that last number. Yeah. That's just one house with an 80 that's a million yeah. dollars? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. right. my understanding, yeah. Wow. Do you have a picture of that? <laughs> I know, we'll have to look that up and <laughs> see where that is. Wow. It's, it's on the moon is what it is. Is that what yeah. it is? Interesting. Any other questions? Councilmember Bingle, you have to have a question. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. If I did, I would hold it to the end. Okay. <sighs> Stephanie, thank you so much. Okay, uh, about, it's been about a month ago, maybe a little less, um, I had the opportunity to sit down with Daniel Clemmy and Dane Jensen and talk about um, housing navigators. And I'm going to invite them up to talk about their organization and um, what they've been up to and what their plans are as far as housing um, individuals, homeless individuals, and especially that population of individuals that are difficult and very, very hard to house. So gentlemen, if you'd like to come up and we've got you down for 15, 20 minutes with questions. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, good afternoon, council. I've never been to the Urban Experience Committee before, so. Well, it's a, it's a big experience. Yeah, I can see that. Is this, this, goes, this goes up, right? Your life will change after today. Okay, sweet. Yeah, so let's uh, tell you about our company. Um, so, we are a social purpose corporation, and this uh, slide deck is in regards to the Rights of Way initiative through the State Department of Commerce. So that's just to kind of isolate down kind of what we're talking about. Um, but as a social purpose corporation, uh, we strive to intentionally benefit society by using evidence and impact data measurement and investment structures and designs, by managing impact performance through stakeholder feedback, and contribute directly to the profitability and sustainability of current and future investments in affordable housing. Um, our actual social purpose is the provision of social service referrals and on-site social services and case monitoring and management services in connection with property management of rental housing dedicated to low income and disabled tenants receiving or eligible to receive social services. So basically we can assist property management companies or landlords with high barrier tenants. You know, that's just to put too fine a point on it. And I think our biggest opportunities here is benefiting society, really, and developing the community. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna necessarily read everything verbatim because I know everybody has it in the notes. Um, but I, I think what's critical are creating partnerships and collaborating, right? There's, there's private market units that would house people with high barriers if they worked with us. And that, that's just the facts. And so I, I know there's an affordable housing crisis, but there's also a homelessness emergency. And this, um, I, I made this company two years ago. This was not made for the Row Initiative. Um, this was, this has been what I've been working on for a long time, um, and we'll kind of get to our work history later. Um, but yeah, uh, okay, so um, achieving critical service obligations and required performance measurements for regional stakeholders. That's, that's another critical component. So rapidly moving people um, out of prioritized states' rights of ways and into better living situations, that's a requirement of the row proposal, that, that's kind of a minimum. Um, but we also have three critical impact measurements that we consider to be of immense importance, of paramount importance. And that's a measurable decrease in the number of people experiencing homelessness, or experiencing unsheltered homelessness, an increase in positive housing outcomes, 
and a decrease in returns to homelessness after exiting the system. I think, I think that's really critical. You know, that's, that's one of the things that we're here for is it's not just um, finding housing, but it's also stabilizing, making people feel safe, welcome home, right, opening a door that wouldn't have opened um, unless we worked with them, which is why we overcome traditional barriers to permanent housing. A lot of the people at Camp Hope or at the Catalyst Project or at TRAC have barriers to, to housing. I mean, that's why a lot of people are experiencing homelessness, right, whether it's an eviction or, I mean, even things like bad credit. A lot of people have bad credit since COVID, right? And these are pretty big, you know, it's just like they just get screened out. Um, and I, I really don't think that's right, to be honest with you. Um, and so in order to make that better, we need to increase our community's capacity to provide permanent housing placement, uh, placements from private market rental housing to people uh, experiencing homelessness. We also believe that this is risk mitigation. I mean, at the end of the day, um, landlords don't really know what's going on. They're kind of the last to know a lot of times about, about what's happening because there's a lot of, I've been used to working with a lot of small mom and pop landlords. Big property management companies are a little bit more on top of it. But we have trust, right, because we communicate very clearly to them about what's going on. And so people would take a chance if it was branded the right way, if it was mes messaged the right way. And that's where we come in, because we do believe that innovation means helping more people today than we did yesterday. That, that, that is what I think innovation is, and that's what Dane believes innovation is. So here's our scope of work. Um, we have a pretty limited scope of work. I believe that's the best practice, especially as we move towards a regional model. Um, there's a lot of places that kind of do a little bit of everything, and I think you're gonna see that start to go away, um, if I were to guess. And so we've, we've really limited our scope of work to managing landlord outreach and engagement strategies, developing uh, private market um, housing provider partnerships and relationships because we want to quickly identify these units and we want to pay and then we want to house people. That's key, is speed. Uh, he, you know, getting their firstest with the mostest, if you will. Um, I, I think that's critical because a lot of times programs are kind of on a, their own timeline. Right, and, and that's because that's the grant requirements, of course. But when you're dealing with the, the private market, you're in a competition against Fairchild Air Force Base, against Amazon, against all these, you know, all these places. And so in order to keep that vacancy, you gotta pay them this incentive fund slash holding fee. It's gonna keep the door open so that somebody can move in and we'll coordinate with the providers, like in this case would be the Empire Health Foundation, Spokane Low Income Housing Consortium, Revive, uh, Jules, uh, all the people involved with the row proposal to find, you know, the, the tenant needs to choose that place. So that can take a little time, which is why we hold that unit for them. So that gives this team time to find somebody who wants to live there and it's gonna be beneficial for them. Um, so our outreach plan, uh, we're, we're pretty keen on marketing and we know who to market to. We're marketing to private market landlords. There's a lot of them. Some of them are hard to find. Um, not, not so hard for us. Um, through the relationships and partnerships we've had over the last five years. Um, there's a lot of people that, you know, they don't even know that anything has really changed because being a landlord can be very part-time. Um, and so there's some people that have had good tenants in there for a long time, right? And like, they're, they're just kind of unaware. And so mm -hmm. providing that education and clearly communicating the need and clearly communicating the risk. Because if you tell people the truth, which we have, which is like, look, you're gonna be housing people with high barriers. And that's a good thing for everybody, right? It gives them a safe place to live. And we believe that uh, benefits to external stakeholders will lead to benefits to internal stakeholders, which is us. So I think by helping the community, everyone's gonna be raised up. I think that's critical. Um, we'll be providing financial assistance, uh, uh, move-in kits, landlord incentive funds, which we'll go over here in a second. Um, but we're gonna guarantee rent for a year. A year is a long time to stabilize, and that's where developing partnerships isn't just with landlords, it's also with places like the Spokane Housing Authority, um, community colleges. You know, I, I think it's a good thing for somebody to exit programs. I think that, I, I think that can be a good thing, but it's not, for, not everyone can. So getting them on something that's more long term, absolutely, and yes, we've, we've working pretty closely with the Housing Authority on that, because some people will need to voucher in place. Good, they're stable, you know, welcome home. 
Okay, we can keep going. Uh, so we have to follow all the, the row standards. We do have our own uh, proprietary systems that we've made, um, and we do require quite a bit of documentation from the landlord. Um, one, we want to know what, what, like what's happening and where is it happening and who did it happen with. It's a safety thing, as well as our, that's how you get good data, right? Because we want this to go really well because this could scale very nicely in communities that need help. And so it's critical that we have accurate data and perform as we say we're going to. Okay. And just let me know if you guys have any questions as we as we move on. Does anybody have any questions right now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's do uh, Councilmember Kinnear, Bates. I felt Bates, like there was questions. And so. then Bingle. Okay, so you mentioned you've been in business for two years. Yes. But then you said that in your five years experience, so what did you do before? Great question. Um, so previously I worked as the landlord liaison for Goodwill Supportive Services for Veteran Families program. Um, I worked there for two and a half years, and then I was the landlord liaison for the Spokane Housing Authority for over a year, and then I made this company. Okay, and so I imagine you're gonna show us um, performance measures towards the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely, great question. So glad to have you here. Um, can you just g give me your um, high elevation, what's the pitch to a landlord of why they would wanna work with you? What's the, what's the win for them? I'm sure there is, so, but if you could just right. explain it to us, because that's what we gotta get our minds of. Why would they want to? And I'm, I'm, I can Absolutely. imagine, but I'd wanna hear it from okay. you. Okay, uh, great question. Okay, so why would you wanna work with us? One, we're paying you a lot of money, which means we can have a business relationship, because I know the nonprofit providers can't really do that, right? They have to follow their vision and mission. And they have to, they have language that they use, like a lot of these providers I have friendships with, like on a personal level. And I think it's good that they can talk to their people a certain way. But they're very skittish about talking to landlords a certain way, right? <clears throat> because they need the housing. They truly do. And it's really hard for these rapid rehousing programs to get people housed. And so by providing a pretty large incentive, what I'm incentivizing is to not have a screening criteria. That way we can overcome these historic, you know, there's vulnerable populations and they have to find housing. And so we're not talking about housing that's built 10 years from now or two years from now. We're talking about units that are available today, right? And so in order to incentivize them, one, you have to have that relationship because the amount of money we're paying is pretty significant. But at the same time, I've seen damages in units that were 30 to $50,000. And so it's, it's not gonna work for everyone. This is not gonna work for every landlord. For sure. I think this works really well for multifamily. Myself. Um, I, I don't think there's as many families that are eligible through the Roe Initiative, as far as I've been told. Right? Now, there might be some reasonable accommodations to go from a one bedroom to a two bedroom, which we also help with, by the way. Um, but really, what we've been told is the need is studios and one bedrooms. Does that? An administrative overhead, like, um, so some, some landlords. Uh, so working with service providers, um, vouchers for instance, uh, there's a lot of landlord needs to learn, and especially for uh, smaller mo mom and pop operators, um, they may not have a lot of experience with it. So one of the things we offer, you know, with, with Daniel's experience, like being a landlord liaison, is seeing both sides of the picture and be able to explain that to the landlord so that they understand, you know, what the compliance requirements are and like factually, but also in a practical way, like how do you deal with this situation um, so that their, their objections or their barriers or their fears about participating can be addressed and we have a plan for them. So it's not like things are gonna go right every time, but to make sure that the landlord trusts that they've got help and there's a plan if it does go wrong is, is another part of the puzzle. Yeah, and we also pay for utilities too. So we're paying for rent and utilities. And I'm doing that because the most common reason for eviction is non-payment of rent. And you can't evict somebody for non-payment of utilities, but it is something I've seen many, many landlords deal with, is like my tenant hasn't paid their utility, oh, which by the way, thank you for paying for people's utilities. I know that's very appreciated. Because that, that also causes people to go into crisis, right? Like when the, when the bills keep coming and you can't pay, it freaks people out. So that's why we're trying to provide a safe and stable home so that that's just one less thing to worry about. It's time to work on your life. Right, which is why we coordinate with these providers that can provide that case management or those, you know, that, those services that people need on an individual level. 
I think it's good to work with the experts, the people that have the buy-in. Just like I buy in with landlords, they have buy-in with their clients, which is why we work really well together. Just before I turn it over to you, it might help if you talk just quickly about how many units you are, you sure. have, I don't know what the word is, captured or that you're... Yeah, so um, right now it, it really just kind of, this one's a little older, uh, this says 20, um, but there's been some back and forth between Commerce and the city and ourselves. Um, I believe our current amount that we've been able to ensure that we can do is 30. Okay. Right, I think 30 is a, one, a better number um, because we wanna, we wanna aim high. Okay, I wanna be the best in the world at this. This isn't trying to do a good job. I, I personally value virtuosity. I wanna be great at housing people that, that have barriers into permanent housing. And so we wanna aim high and perform well because that's when there's a lot of cities across America that need help. There's a lot of people in this city that need help. I grew up here. So we're, start, we're starting here. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining that's gonna look some, somewhere along the lines of most of those will be studios and one bedrooms. Okay. Go ahead. All right, thanks for being here, guys. I know we had uh, chatted about this previously and I, I'm, I'm pretty interested in what you guys are, are uh, proposing. Um, so a landlord gets a guaranteed rent for a year, okay? What happens if the person there is in crisis and they leave? Great question. Um, so if there's damage in the unit, uh, we have access to a damage mitigation fund that we've asked Commerce to fund, which I believe they have, uh, that the city of Spokane, I believe, would be holding on to as far as I know, which I think is a great idea. Um, because I've personally dealt with the Department of Commerce mitigation fund, not. I know they're funding us, so I don't want to talk crap, but it takes time, right? But we want to get that unit fixed, and because we are going to pay for a year, let's get somebody else in there. And that will happen, because it's not always going to be the best housing choice for that person. Maybe they do need to go to transitional housing. Maybe they need to go to permanent supportive housing. This is permanent housing, right? So if somebody's in crisis, having these releases of information, this communication system, so that we can all kind of have, like, a, the biggest offensive line we can around the quarterback, and the quarterback in this case is the tenant, sometimes success is getting out. But we don't want to evict people because that's, you can do mutual terminations. There's things you can do. Now, will that always happen? It might go bad a couple times, but we have pretty high performance metrics here. We're saying that we want 90% of the people to remain housed after six months. That's pretty high, right? Because why do it if we're not gonna do it great? So then let's say a person, we pay for their rent for a year, they're there for a month, and then they disappear and we can't find them, we don't know where they are, anything like that. How long do we hold that space for them? So we have what's called vacancy loss payments, um, which just covers that amount of time. But at some point, uh, and we're, we are working with landlord attorneys on this, at some point a property is considered abandoned. Okay, and those, those definitions have changed uh, a little bit. We wanna make sure that they you know, can get their property back. That's where you, you reach out to the community right, the shelter system, call 211. If you have the right release of information, people can tell you stuff. We want to, this, we're, we buy a lot of stuff for their moving kits too. Let's get that back to them for their, for wherever it is they went. But we don't pay a year up front, not right now. I have asked to, and I was told I can. Um, I think that would apply more towards like sex offenders um, that are in single room occupancies. I could see doing a year up front as an additional incentive because a lot of landlords have no idea like what that's all about. So that's for a pretty specific type. I mean, that's probably a larger property manager, to be honest. But yeah, we want to get somebody else in there. You got to get somebody else in there. You don't, you took that, you took the money. You took the deal. So the deal is one year. So then we pay them basically for a year, uh, basically a subscription to their housing. We're going to take this year, mm -hmm. right? And, and we have it to house folks who are in this pool that, that have high barriers, yes. okay? So somebody leaves after three months, I don't know what the abandonment you know, period is, if it's three months, just for sake of argument here, then that's six months left. Do we then, the next time somebody comes in, do we pay them a year up front for that person as well, or have we just straight up paid them a year up front for that, for that unit of housing? At this point, it would become, in this, uh, like say, six month example, I would do a six month lease, right, at, at that point. Um, we wanna do one year leases with everybody. Uh, that's what we wanna do, and we want it in their name because we wanna grow the rental history. There's also uh, programs that allow you to increase people's credit score, even if they're on sub, I mean, that's what Fannie Mae does. They increase people's credit score even if they're on a subsidy. That's a good thing, 
right? Like everybody needs all the help they can get right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're, we only have enough funding to hold the units for a year. And, and to, to yeah. answer a detail of mm -hmm. your question, is that $7,500 um, is for the full year. So even if someone moves in, um, there's a better housing option, they move out, <coughs> they don't get another incentive. Uh, the deal is that 12 months. So the, the second person moving in, there's no new incentive, and we just get them back onto the, the program. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're not incentivizing turning and burning. The churn rate, if you will. Yeah. So, so then my next question would be, um, you know, do you, have you seen other successful examples of this either in the city or in the state, elsewhere in the Absolutely. country? Absolutely. It's a best practice. Uh, great question. Uh, does this work? Yes. Um, HUD has a magazine called Evidence Matters. And if you believe in evidence-based best practices and you haven't read Evidence Matters, you're missing out. Okay, the winner of 2019 issue has a full, the full issue is on successful landlord incentives. Winner of 2019, HUD, Evidence Matters. It's worth looking into. Um, LASHA, the Los Angeles something something, I'm kind of forgetting the exact one. They have a landlord incentive fund too. That's their regional homelessness authority for lack of a better term. Landlord incentives are critical in areas that have a low vacancy rate that aren't building enough housing. Because it's like you're in a competition with everyone else. That's the fact. You're not even just in, you know, forget even just overcoming the barriers. The fact of the matter is people move in quick, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of nuts. So in order to give them a competitive advantage to get into these units, we'll just go, we'll go get those. We'll go, we'll go get them for them. And sorry, my last question before we do this. Do we understand uh, how much money um, the city and, um, and different regional partners are, are paying every year for these higher barrier tenants uh, versus what we would be paying if we were able to find them successful housing and get them connected to services? What's that, what's that financial difference? Um, we, uh, so we based our payment model off of 120% of the voucher payment standard, and we had another 120, uh, and then another 120%. Uh, so. Well, and, it's 1344 for a, for a one bedroom unit for a year. So we did that because sometimes people do run their heaters like all day, every day, right? And since we're paying for utilities, we just didn't want to have to charge back the program. It's kind of like there's a deal here. You get 12 months of rent at this price, you get this incentive fund, you get access to a mitigation fund. And the reason why we went with mitigation uh, rather than deposits is I, I have personally seen landlords be predatory with deposits. Just gonna say that, like, I sh I, it is what it is. Not all landlords. Not all landlords, of course, but a lot of times people think they're gonna get that money. So it's also communicating to the client, hey, there's, there isn't that f also, right? Like, nope, there's a mitigation fund to cover damage uh, over normal wear and tear in the unit. It has to be able to pass an HHS inspection, which we use the city's HHS inspection. It has to be able to pass that. And um, another, piece is one thing that really got us very excited uh, from the get-go is, is that if we are able to do this successfully, that we get to take some of the burden off the other, uh, the system, right? So I, maybe you were going towards this as like time in the hospital, ambulance rides, you know, uh, police overhead, all the things associated with homelessness. Um, our, our hope and our goal is that when you get them housed that it, it relieves some of that burden. Um, and. So I don't know if we have like local Spokane statistics for that, but we have seen other cities that have compiled that data and it's, yep. it seems very expensive for cities. I'm sure you guys are fully yeah. aware of that. So we hope to help relieve some of that. And that would be great if we could get somehow, if we could distill that down into Spokane numbers would be great because one of the things we learned uh, you know, from, from different partners in other cities is that the amount that you're spending on these individuals every year versus the amount that we can spend if we can get them into housing and into Correct. services, it's like 20% of what we would be paying. And so there's a really great, I think, fiscally conservative argument to be made here. Yep. And if you could have those numbers for us, that would be really helpful. I, I've heard the yeah. numbers between 35 and 50,000 for somebody to experience homelessness. Mm -hmm. Now that's a pretty big mm -hmm. span, but also you gotta consider that the market's moving, right? Um, it's getting more expensive, rent's going up, right? And so a year is also rent stabilization in many ways. The reason why I based the payment model off of, you know, 120% plus 20% more was after a year, that'll probably fit the voucher payment standard, right? Because that's gonna be, that way it's sustainable because yes, people are gonna probably need to get on vouchers. Guess what, the housing authority in Spokane is badass. Pam's a good leader. Yeah. 
she'll help, she'll help house people. That's what they do. <laughs> I, have, I have experience. That's what they do there. And so, you know, the, it is going to save a ton of money and resources, but it's also going to help their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, give them a shot. It, it's, it's hard. Nobody's, people aren't as nice as they used to be. And so we want to be welcoming um, to the tenants, and we get to be kind of play hardball with landlords, but also support them, right? Because we have this, we're changing kind of the dynamic. And something to add to that is that there's, <clears throat> there's unintentional uses of the system. Let's say like, like the, um, the sorry, hospital system. Sorry, Dane, would you oh. get just a little closer oh, so I'm that sorry. people watching can hear you? Yes, yes. Yeah. sorry about that. Um, so there are unintentional uses. Like it wasn't planned that, there, that the, there'd be a homelessness emergency and that the hospitals would have to, you know, uh, fulfill that, those needs, right? So, um, however, we can't do this alone. We're one piece of the puzzle, right? And so um, the people in the units, they may need social services. They may need all these other things. And so just to be, be aware is that we're a piece of that puzzle um, and us working together with the providers and all, and all that it will be the, the net benefit to society, I guess. But uh, we'll just something to... Let's move forward on the presentation, too. Yep, we've got a couple minutes left. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll kind of... Would you like to go just ask questions? Do you guys have pointy questions? That Does anybody like have a lot of questions, or do you want them to... We can kind of, yeah, let's just kind we'll of speed, speed through. Yeah, the... yeah, we'll speed through. So uh, we made some custom addendums because we were told by the Department of Commerce and Jules and Slick and EHF that it's like the big question was, how are you going to make a lease that allows people to move in? And the answer is you can't. I can't tell a property management company which lease to use. I'm not their lawyer and I'm not a property manager. So what we did was we made custom addendums. Now we've partnered with uh, Gonzaga Law School's Business Innovation uh, Clinic and they've been helping us draft this. And we've also partnered with frankly, the best landlord attorney in the area whose specialty is affordable housing. He represents the housing authority, for example, to help us make this. Because, you know, the landlord, in order to, to get the money, they have to agree to suspend their usual process, right? Just like the tenant, we, we, uh, if you go down, um, the tenant's also agreeing. We're giving them kind of like, here's how you be a tenant. Here's how you clean right, because we're buying them moving kits for a reason. So then we kind of give like the standard operating procedure, right, on how to use the tools in the moving kit, which is like clean. It's not so easy. Not everyone was taught how to clean, right? Like we're trying to meet people where they're at by kind of starting over and starting from square one. Let's have a successful tenancy, at least a good shot at it. And okay. this was based on the... Yep, and this was based off of, we based off a couple things. One was uh, HUD's um, model for subsidized lease, Jules Helping Hands Good Neighbor Agreement, um, we also based it off of the house rules uh, from two different landlord associations, as well as a couple of housing authorities, um, like for their own properties. We did quite a bit of research to make something that was robust and to keep people safe. Safety is number one. I mean, housing first, but really it's safety first, right? We need the providers to be safe. We need the tenants to be safe. We need to be safe. The landlord needs to be safe. All right, we'll keep moving through here. See, Wait, like cleanliness, housekeeping, et cetera. Councilmember what, what is your referral process? So how do you get potential residents into the program and to connect them with landlords? Great question. So as of tomorrow, we'll be going to the rights of way. There's like a provider meeting. We're going to use a case conferencing model. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get the units and bring it to them because they know their people. And it's like, does anybody know anybody that would want a studio in Brown's edition? Mm -hmm. Right, and they'll, they'll be, yes, <laughs> for sure. But we have to make sure that they're eligible for the funding, like that's very important because that's all we're being paid to do is to house people that are eligible. Um, now we might find units that would take somebody else. That would be great to give referrals to other providers. We, that's that's the, the goal, right? It's to help as many people as possible. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be on the provider to ensure the eligibility because they're the ones working directly with people from the camp. Yep, and they have to choose. You know, we're not plugging anybody in. They have to choose that how they need. If they don't want to live there, let's, like, don't put them there. Um, and so just uh, I give some definitions for some uh, various things so it's good to know, like, what we're talking about because I, I have some specific language. So I give the definitions for them. Um, we keep going here. Uh, so we're using uh, what's called a performance budgeting model. Uh, we want to be paid to perform. Right, and I, I think that's really important because this is new. 
and it's okay to have high standards and say like, did it work, did it, did it not work? Well, we need to do everything we can to perform at a high level because we're, I'm saying to you guys right now, that's what we want to do. So you, you can hold me to that, right? We want people to be, we want it to be a success. Now being a success might just mean that this person didn't get evicted, they went to transitional housing, we got somebody, look, let's keep the unit, right? Let's keep it affordable and stabilized. Um, I'm also, we'll kind of uh, just go all the way down. Um, we can kind of talk a little bit about our, our, uh, ourselves real quick before we end. Um, so currently, uh, I'll let Dane kind of give his background real quick. Sure, uh, just in, in one minute. Um, I am very excited for the opportunity to participate in this. Um, I see an opportunity to like make a genuine impact on the community. Um, and I started that in Tacoma. Um, I got to work for a nonprofit um, biotechnology incubator. And the goal there was to help uh, scientists commercialize technology. But really, it was about connecting all the, the resources in the region and creating a pipeline, so to speak, about uh, you know, educating kids from you know, K through 12 uh, STEM so that they can grow up and engage in this new and growing industry, which is biotechnology, science, um, computer science, that kind of thing. So um, what was important is, is building core partnerships with the University of Washington Tacoma, um, the economic development um, department in the city, um, other regional authorities, um, you know, Center for Urban Waters was a good example. Um, they, they do clean water technology. So it's partnering with those people and helping to solve their problems. Um, and when I did that, philanthropy was a big part of it. And that's where I met the people who are the pillars of the community. And I was amazed at how much goes on that people aren't aware of. And that was my first taste of this. And so moving back to Spokane, um, I had an interest and I met Daniel and he told me what he was working on and I just was all about it. So, on it. Said, yeah. Yep, and just to finish up, um, you know, I'm on the COC board. Uh, I've been doing the housing and homelessness stuff, like I said, for the last five years. I'm currently the president of the Landlord Association. Um, I've been on their board of directors since 2019. I'm on the Move to Work Advisory Committee for Spokane Housing Authority. Um, and I'm also the founding chair and very proud of the Spokane Landlord Liaison Network. That's an excellent, excellent network. I'm so glad it still exists. Mark Ward's on, he's the chair now. He's great. You keep your eyes on him. He's going places. Um, I was also, uh, Ozzy Knezovich reached out to us and had us join the Emergency Operations Center as permanent housing subject matter experts. And he asked one question. This is how, this is how we got on can you actually house those people? And I said, yes, Sheriff, I can. I said, okay. <laughs> That's about the interaction I had with him. Uh, but it was, it was notable because we, our parents are both law enforcement. Um, and that's kind of where civil service was part of how we were raised. And like, if there's anybody you don't lie to, it was Sheriff. And so I made, I gave him my word that I would do this. And like I said, I had pretty limited interaction. Um, but I've also presented at two different fair housing conferences. I've presented for the Spokane Homeless Coalition. Um, I go to these things still. I go to the Homeless Coalition, right? Like I'm, I'm very involved. Um, I'm actually listed in the COC's 2022 NOFA as, a, as an expert in landlord outreach and engagement um, because that's, that's our thing is I, I, I'm kind of a Rosetta Stone. You know, I can turn social work into landlord jargon because they don't know what you're talking about sometimes, and I do. And so I'll talk to them and we got units. We have units now, by the way. There's vacancies right now that people could move into and there has been for a long time. And so keeping those relationships, extremely, extremely important. And if there's any questions to kind of finish it up, um, we didn't get through everything, but it's- No, nope, but I think we know where to find you if we have more questions. Look for the hats. Look for the hats. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for all your work. Okay, thank you. And we look forward to progress. Awesome. Okay. You guys have a nice day and Thanks. happy birthday. Thank you. Okay. Jen Saracides. And we're going to talk about the Cannon Street Shelter. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, we are requesting to amend the existing Cannon Street contract with the Salvation Army, which ended on 12-31-2022. We're requesting a contract extension through 5-31 of 2023 at a total of $800,000, which will come from reallocated Department of Commerce Shelter Program grant funding. And then at the conclusion of this amendment, the intention is to absorb the, uh, the Cannon Shelter beds into the Trent Resource and Assistance Center. Okay, let's talk. 
Go ahead. So, thank you. Are we starting the transition now of Cannon shelter beds to the Trent? When will that process actually begin? And so is there a cap that we're no longer accepting people at Cannon currently? We have not developed the transition plan yet, but I, um, as soon as this is approved, we would um, begin that plan in earnest. And my assumption would be that we would continue to serve folks there as we transition them over. We wouldn't, as somebody transitioned, we would not backfill their beds, but we wouldn't um, like start telling people they can't stay there until they've been transitioned, if that makes sense. It does, but then you never really close the, the location. I'm sorry, what's that? Then you never really close the location as they transition out and others are coming in. Yes, yes, as they transition a, out, we uh, would. A, a clean cut of yes. where we are not accepting any more. Correct. Into the shelter. Yep. Does that make, no, I'm, con so as they transition out, then that one bed goes. Is that how we? That's what I would think, but okay. we don't have that plan formalized. Okay. And certainly we would put that together with Salvation Army and we'd be glad to come back and present to you what that plan looks like if that would be helpful. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Does the, uh, does the contract formalize the 25% fee? It does not as an existing um, amendment to an existing contract. So the line item for their um, uh, budget was for program operations. So they'd be able to spend that however they need to in order to keep that open through May 31st. Okay. And Jen, have they received any compensation at Canon since they took over the operations? They received November and December. November and December. Yeah, okay. but they have not been paid for January or February. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Is that sort of our timeline then for transitioning out of Canon altogether? Is the end of May? Yes. Okay. And so then all of that would just be transitioning to the track shelter? Correct. Okay. I have a question. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment, okay. actually. Now that I've thought about it. So one, I think this is a good idea be, uh, for a few reasons. One, the level of services are, at Canon are not the same as at TRAC, and it's much more geared towards that. It's cheaper to serve them at TRAC per person. Uh, and um, we've been starting conversations with other potential providers for that fragile medical shelter that Canon could then transition into, because uh, that's really the big gap in our system. Uh, my only request is I've told you before is that I think it should be by the end, end of April and then we get a uh, discount on how much we do since we're not doing it in May. That's my understanding. It's a maximum of 800000 and if they finish the transition by end of April or even one week in May, we'll, we won't have to pay the full 800000 set. Correct. Once it closed down, if it closed down prior to the end of May, then we would recoup those dollars. Yeah. Um, we are coming close to mid-March, which um, is about a month and a half out yep. so it's tight yeah thanks and then when we talk about the medical piece that would be respite beds as well as people that are sick i mean what's at, at that Cannon? entail yeah uh we have not explored that i mean i know there's been some thoughts and i know providence has come forward with a proposal at one point in time okay. um but i'm not aware of ex the, the exact details of that proposed program Okay, it'd be great if we could do something with that respite. I mean, there are people that are, I've heard of two, and then I experienced one in um, Dutch Jake Park that mm -hmm. a lady was dropped off after um, surgery and there was nowhere for her to go. So she was in a wheelchair hanging out at Dutch Jake and it, we've got to find a place for those people. Absolutely. To get stronger. Yep. Yes. So as we have these conversations, it's not something that my understanding the city would be taking on. Right. That would be a private right uh, provider uh, doing that work to be great or with other funding or but with yeah. other funding we might provide the building perfect it'd be great okay great no other questions thanks jen thank you okay i'm gonna call up richard colton and we're going to talk <clears throat> affordable housing funding recommendations and we've got about five minutes does that give you enough time oh plenty thank you good afternoon the uh, CHHS department is seeking council approval to allocate approximately $7.1 million in a combination of CDBG, home, and the sales and use tax revenue to fund nine affordable housing projects that were recommended for funding by the Affordable Housing Committee and then 
the CHHS board as a whole. And this is a result of the most recent rapid rehousing acquisition and rehab NOFA that we put out um, at, towards the end of the year and closed in January. Uh, these funding recommend recommendations support new construction of 89 units of affordable housing, acquisition and conversion of 59 market rate units into affordable housing units, rehabilitation and preservation of seven existing affordable housing projects which represent approximately 76 units and includes preservation of 10 transitional housing units. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, you're using the word affordable. What is the, are you using the HUD definition? So affordable, uh, typically these units are going to be affordable at the 30 to 60 percent of area median income. <clears throat> Um, how much of it, if you, is for new units or or reclaimed units as opposed to the maintenance and rehabilitation of existing units? So it's going to be about a million dollars for the conversion of market rate to affordable and okay. two and a half million for new units. Okay. And I know in this round there was a lot more money for um, maintenance and... Uh, updates of existing units. Is there, and part of that's because we gave a lot of ARPA, and we had the $1590. Are there other projects getting in the pipeline? I think a lot of us are like, oh, we gotta get these new units as opposed to where people, just making it better where they already live, it's needed as well. But I'm just wondering, is there a sense that there's gonna be a new pipeline of projects now that we have more funding? There is, um, part of our goal is to realign our funding NOFAs or RFPs uh, to be in line with the other funding streams such as housing trust fund and the tax credit program. Right now we're kind of out of sync. So speaking with experienced developers, we need to realign that, which we are planning to do later this year. We will have a, a, another NOFA out, which will be geared towards new unit production, mm -hmm. primarily funded with home and then the sales and use tax dollars. The impetus for this NOFA was really to expend CDBG dollars to meet timeliness, so. And when do you expect the next uh, NOFA? Uh, late August into September. Okay, great. Go ahead. And when we're defining new units, is that units above what we currently have or is that just new construction units? New construction of units, actual new units being built. So for example, in one of the projects, I believe we're tearing an existing structure down and building new units right next to it. Does though, do those count as new units by our metric or not? Yes, new units were, there's existing, four, I think it's 41 units mm -hmm. for the High Fumi Inn. Those will be torn down and 86 units of replacement housing built on that site. So then is that 45 new units or 86 new units? We count it as 86 new okay. units. Okay, yeah. so realistically adding to the current stockpile, we're adding 45 and not correct. 86. That's okay. correct. Is there a reason why we uh, categorize it that way as opposed to the increased capacity? Well, we, we kind of underwrite and review these as projects as a whole. So yeah, there's a net loss initially of those 40 some units, but when we look at that project as we're funding, it's, it is a new uh, unit production of 86 units. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's how you spin it, but it, because the new project is for that complete build, we look at it that way. So when we're putting that out, can we have a, a separate line of, of data that says, new units, here are the new units being constructed, here's the increased number of units, because sure. I think that's important for the community to know, because obviously we want to make sure that the, these dollars are being spent well to increase the housing supply. And so if we say 86 new units, then people can think, oh great, this money's going to that, but realistically we're adding 45 because 41 were in such disrepair they needed to be torn down and then rebuilt. And so I think that'd be um, good information for the community to have. We can add that to our table, awesome. sure. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us where the Haifume, where is that located in the city? It's, um, I, believe, I believe it's on like Perry the District. Perry, yeah, it's huh? Lower South Hill, Perry. Mm -hmm. One more question? Councilmember for Cathcart, no? Okay. Council President, almost across the street from the Haystack. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yep. I know, I know where it is now. Yep. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yep. Next up is Megan Duvall. Is she? She's virtual. Oh, hi, Megan. So we've got you down for three. You're going to brief us three nominations. Yep. 
Okay. Yep. Go for I'm it. Quick, but I also have to because you know I'm your historic preservation officer. I have to um, do an old timey birthday, which is um, I'm going to wish you a happy birth anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. Sure thing. Okay, so let me share my screen here. All right. Okay, so I will run through this super quick because you could all probably do it yourselves by now. Um, but our Spokane Register of Historic Places is our local program for listing properties. It is done with the consent of the owner for listing. Um, this is how we protect historic resources through the management agreement that um, you as council sign along with the property owner. And we only do design review when a building permit is sought for these buildings, and it is a vehicle for our incentives to be offered to property owners. There we go. Um, in order to be eligible, properties generally have to be 50 years of age or older, and they have to meet our criteria. You can list buildings, sites, districts, structures, and objects. Category A of the five categories, Category A is a broad pattern of Spokane's history. Category B is an association with significant people in Spokane. Category C is our architecture category. D is our prehistory or archaeology. And Category E is our cultural heritage. Okay, and Council Member Bingle will be happy to hear all three of these today are from District 1. Okay. Built in 1919, the Aarons and Aarons Automobile Dealership at 827 West 2nd Avenue meets Spokane Register of Historic Places under Category A for its significance as a building associated with the evolution of the automobile and automobile-related businesses in Spokane. The 1920s was the decade in which most of the buildings that were built downtown were specifically used to house automobile sales and accessories, at least in our downtown. The Aaron's building was constructed with a showroom and service facility for the sale of Stevens and Oakland automobiles during the formative stages of Spokane's Auto Row. The building included both a showroom at the front and a garage for new and used cars. First and Second Avenues were Spokane's Auto Row, and eight dealerships were constructed between Wall and Cedar in the 1920s. Automobile-related businesses filled in the storefronts of the other commercial buildings along 1st and 2nd Avenue corridors. As the number of automobile manufacturers dropped between 1920 and 1929, demand for automobile showrooms declined and many transitioned to servicing automobiles and eventually to retail and office uses. The Aarons and Aarons Automobile Dealership, designed by Cowley and Wells, was one of several automobile dealerships and garages designed by that firm between 1919 and 1923. The building is a simply detailed brick commercial building. Occupying a prominent corner lot location, the showroom and sales gallery in the front part of the building was accessed through the north pedestrian entrance and the garage in the rear with shop doors on the west elevation to accommodate the passage of vehicles. The Aarons and Aarons Automobile de Dealership contains good integrity of location and association. Although the form of the facade has been altered by removing uh, the pediments over entries from the original construction back in 1919, the, store, the removal of original storefronts and the rebuilding of contemporary storefronts, the building maintains enough integrity to, con to convey the character of the original building. Okay, moving on, we have the Spokane Brewing and Malting Company. Constructed for the Spokane Brewing and Malting Company in 1913, the building at 910 West Broadway meets the Spokane Register of Historic Places under Categories A and C for its significance as a building associated with the beer brewing industry and um, as well as for its significant architectural character as a vernacular commercial brick building with intricate brickwork. Spokane Brewing and Malting Company uh, building is eligible under Category A because it was constructed during the growth of the beer industry in Spokane and is a fine example of buildings of that type and period. Of course, that growth was put on hold during Prohibition from 1916 to 1933. And you can actually see the building, I've, I've drawn a, a square around, but 
Um, behind that, where the old YWCA building was, that is their actual brewing um, company. Across the street, Kitty Corner is the old is the Wonder Building that's been rehabbed recently. So that gives you an idea of sort of the massive scale of these breweries. The building functioned as both the Spokane Brewing and Malting offices, as well as their bottling house, and is associated with the large brewing plant that occupied the lot east of the subject building until 1928. Or, I'm sorry, 1938. You can see the Enjoy Rainier beer. That's the, the brewing plant in more like the 1950s. The building also is, also an import, is also important as a legacy of the four Galland brothers and their contributions to Spokane real estate, financial, and brewery industry. The Gallons were originally from Oregon and came to Spokane in the early 1890s. They soon became heavily invested in Spokane real estate and in addition to owning the Northwest Loan and Trust Company and the Gallon Burke Brewery, they also controlled the Spokane Realty Company, which built the Realty Building in 1910, which is down at the end of, um, like in the 200 block of Riverside um, and acts as, I think it's one of Catholic Charities um, apartment buildings. A major event in the Spokane brewing business was consummated in 1902 when three Spokane breweries, the Gallon Burke, Henco Brewery, and New York Brewery, merged in a $1 million transaction to become the Spokane Brewing and Malting Company. The building was sold out of the Gallon Brothers real estate portfolio in 1938 when the Spokane Brewing and Malting Company was bought. As an early downtown brewery, it is a rare remnant of the heyday of brewing in Spokane. It is one of only two existing buildings built as breweries that remain in downtown Spokane, the other being the Sade Brewery um, that was built in 1902 in the University District. This building is also eligible under Category C as a unique building both in terms of design and detailing. The brick itself is unique in Spokane, a high-fired brick with rounded edges reminiscent more of street pavers, but more finely rendered. The brick is composed in an intricate pattern that richly details the main facades. The building form is distinctive and attractive with its horizontal striations, corbeline articulated window arches, and a pronounced pressed tin entry architrave, a parapet with stepped and rounded pediments and corner finials. The Spokane Brewing and Malting Building retains very good integrity of location, design, materials, workmanship, and association. While the replacement of the original windows does reduce the integrity somewhat, its most character-defining feature is the intricate and detailed brickwork throughout the exterior. Okay, one last one for you, and that's quick. So now we have the Hilliard Masonic Lodge. The Hilliard Historic Business District was originally comprised of 12 contributing buildings with no non-contributing or non-historic non-contributing buildings. A 13th building was added to the district in 2005. These buildings represent the strongest con concentration of early 20th century commercial buildings in downtown Hilliard. The 13 buildings that comprise the Hilliard Historic Business District were for those, were those for which the owners had consented to listing. So this is kind of prior to when we had that 50% plus one vote of property owners in order to create a district where everything within the boundaries of the district was considered listed. Um, at this point, we were still signing management agreements between each and every property owner and the city. So that's why it's a little bit different. There are some buildings that are historic that never um, signed management agreements. So a man an amendment is being proposed to the district to add a 14th building, the Hilliard Masonic Temple, at 3023 East Diamond Avenue, which was previously included in the National Register nomination and noted as an exceptional building that is a pivotal resource in the historic district. Built in 1931, the Hilliard Masonic Temple is a well-preserved two-story brick commercial building with two primary facades, fronting Diamond Avenue and Market Street. The building features de decorative variegated raked brick veneer cladding, two-story pilasters capped with a classic brick and metal entablature, and block letters that spell Masonic Temple. The original storefront materials and configuration are intact and include a ceramic tile bulkhead and a recessed corner entrance. 
The Hilliard Masonic Temple was first built by the free and accepted Masons of the Blue Lodge Number no. 133 as one of the Masons' only railroad lodges, constructed to help working class men who worked for the Great Northern Railroad in Hilliard. Spokane architects Roland Van Tyne and Archibald Rigg designed the building. The first floor commercial space was leased from 1931 to 1952 by a variety of companies, including J.C. Penney, Bergen Grocery, Hilliard Cash Market and Meats, Hilliard Booster Improvement Club, and Fonk's Five and Dime Store. The second floor was used by Masonic orders, including the Blue Lodge, Eastern Star, and Job's Daughters and Rainbow Girls. The Hilliard Masonic Temple retains excellent integrity. The building contains the original assembly hall on the second floor, and workmanship, materials, and design have all been retained in outstanding original condition. And so we will be um, reviewing these at the Landmarks Commission meeting on this Wednesday. Thanks, Megan. Does anybody have questions? Good job, as always. Thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoy your day. Thanks. Okay, uh, last on the agenda, we have about a half hour to discuss the Primera facility with uh, Tanya Wallace, Jeffrey Teal, and David Steele. Matt Boston, I don't know, are you coming down for this? Okay. Um, thank you, council members. I think uh, Mr. Steele is making his way in. Tall person here. Um, <clears throat> Jeff is going to cover the first couple slides to really review with you all of the studies that we've just received in. And of course, the last of the studies was from Integris um, that we received on Friday um, afternoon. And then I'm going to kind of cover some of the financial summary of information for you. And then we'll close out with our conclusions from the studies. And Dave has entered the chambers. <laughs> He's here. Hannah Lee, did you get the... Council members, we just finished the presentation um, earlier today. Okay, thank you. So she'll go ahead and print that. If you want to get started, Dave, uh, Jeff. Do you have it in your hand? I have it in my hand. Kelly, if you send that to me, I can get it up on the screen. J the electronic copy, then I can pull it up on the okay. screen. Good afternoon. So, I have more information from the last time we spoke. I do have the Gardner building included now. Uh, and we um, have received the appraisals back. So, the appraisals were done from Jeff Lembeck. Lembeck and the uh, Premier building came back at $13,380,000. Uh, the Public Defender's Office came back at $1.9 and the detectives building came back at a little over three million. Um, we did receive the environmental site assessment back. One quick piece, I'm sorry, if there's still that. Okay. Sure. The detectives building, the Gardner building was acquired in 2010. The city had previously been leasing the building from the county for policing services. Per media release dated back in June 4th of 2010, the remaining debt balance and acquisition is $945,779. We did receive the site inspection back from Premier Building. It is in good condition. Uh, deferred maintenance is just minor little items, not large to be surprising. Uh, major repairs, there's none. Building structure is good, but noted there are some uh, few little observations for some things that need to be done, but again, not alarming. Um, de uh, observed deficiencies, there's a few, but again, they're small. Uh, exterior envelope, generally good. Roof is excluded because of the time frame that we're on. Um, 
I've been on the roof and looked at the roof, but we have not had that surveyed. Um, same with HVAC. Um, but they do have all their preventive maintenance in place. <clears throat> Wouldn't those be probably the two most expensive things? Should we have a better idea? It could be, but okay. it's the time frame of getting a contractor there no, to do I, the. I understand. Yes. Thank you. Uh, plumbing was visible. Plumbing was in good condition. Electrical was in good condition. Uh, the fire system, uh, it's tested. It says system not <coughs> tested, but there's an annual test that they have to do. I'll provide on that, and there was nothing that came up. Uh, the interior was in good condition, and uh, life safety, the garage intercoms have been disabled, but I just found out that they can be turned right back on um, and need to put some ADA grab bars in a restroom. Um, environmental uh, side assessment came back. Again, there was no alarm issues there. Uh, there was no... Um, reason to do a phase two to it because they didn't see anything that needed to be popped out for a phase two. <coughs> and the tenant improvements we did get back from Integris. It came in at about 4.9 um, million. And we also had some tenant improvements that were in-house that were, um, a lot of it was IT. And that came to a total <coughs> of, I don't see that in our file. Six, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're going to utilize most of the furniture. Furniture is in great shape. That's there, uh, and the program space has not been verified yet, but they did go upon the numbers that courts gave them in the square footage, um, and it still would need to go through code for a plan. But we wanted to get a a number to for this presentation. And uh, the total credit square footage is 55,000 square feet. The adjusted is 40,000 square feet. And uh, I think that's my part there. <coughs> Can I ask a quick question? Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, Gardner Building, did we do any estimates as to the, to the cost of and, and a location of where we would move the folks who are there now? I do have all the operating costs that will be right here shown in a moment. As for where they're moving, I do not know. Um, I do have a cost associated for $60,000 if we were to move them into a new space, not saying it's, it's the uh, premier building. I use those numbers from when we moved field engineering. It's close to the same square footage and added a little bit because that was a year and a half ago. That number would change if they're moving into the premier building because they do have furniture that's already there. Okay. So it would be less at Correct. premier? Correct. Correct. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, what, how many people are we talking about in the Gardner building? About 70. 70 people. Okay. And again, so the moving cost for 70 people would just be $60,000? Correct. No, not for 70 people. That's to move the Gardner building. Right, and I thought, is that, you just said there were 70 people in the Gardner? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. I was thinking it was courts. I'm sorry. Yes, 70 people to move all their stuff, files, everything would be about $60,000. Okay, and that, but that doesn't take into account any lease or anything like that that we'd have to Correct. sign? Correct. It does okay. not. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Okay, council members, um, a financial summary. This is a high level. There are a lot of costs that were estimated, uh, just like the 60000 that Jeff talked about. That's just an estimated cost. That does not mean that that's actually what it's going to cost. Um, we've also had to estimate other costs that we didn't have a details from. We had not received those details. But just for perspective, we thought it was important for you to know it's largely with transportation for the jury and transportation for the detainees. We would need to acquire vans and then have that secured, particularly for the detainees being transported. So we've made some assumptions there also for some of the AV technical security infrastructure that would be inside of the building. We made best estimate um, of those costs. We could be very wrong. But we, could, uh, we did our very best, just so that you have some context in that. How many uh, cells are we, are we talking about? 
Um, that would be with Integris, and I'm not recalling that after reviewing it very, very briefly only on Friday of how many detain, detainment cells there, there would be. Are dozens, hundreds? Like, I mean. Oh, I, I'm assuming less than five. It's oh, just okay. holding for that just day's hearings. Yeah. They're not stay overnight. Um, why, why do you have to transport the jury? Why, why can't they get there on their own? They very well could. Jury, is check, jury would still continue to check in over at the Spokane County campus, and the county would still manage our jury uh, program for us that they do now. Mm. So it's presumed that okay. it's just presumed, and there was a, an, a line item in those cost details of what would the juries do, jury selection, because it would be managed still from the county campus. And then, yes, they could get in their vehicles and drive themselves over there, or we would arrange transportation. In this cost assumptions, it's just assumed we would arrange transportation and take them to the different location. That could, can that be changed? Yeah, yeah that can totally be yeah. changed. Oh, okay. yeah. That's just our current okay. way to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at Howard and mm -hmm. going, eh? okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but that, I mean, that was a very small part, but we wanted <clears throat> to make sure that that was there. So the purchase price, um, certainly for the premier campus of the buildings, is $12.2 million. Um, ARPA is a funding source, and I know that that's a, a challenge to read there. And then lease back revenue, assumed at least for a full year, and then lease back six months after that. So that would be a funding source there. And then the tenant improvements, which also includes the cost of the studies that you've, we've received, um, is about $6.8 in total. Um, going down to the Gardner building, yes, we could sell that building, but we would have to fund the debt, pay the debt off first, and then pay relocation costs. Oh, can you, yeah. Oh, you're going to make that bigger. Public defenders' um, offices, the appraised value at $1.9 million. Um, I think down at the, there, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just, do we have this? I mean, we can't quite see those, or I can't quite. Do we I'll have forward it, it to it's, you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can't see either hand one. <clears throat> we'll get that for you. Wrong glasses. <laughs> In total of the of the one time costs, it comes to after selling the assets, taking into account ARPA, that we would need approximately nine point four million dollars in addition to what we already have set aside. And that would be, you know give or take even 10%. You could say, we're not going to do transport, we're not going to buy the vans, we're not going to do this, or we're not going to do that. But I would say usually with a 10% margin, which would be about a million dollars. Councilmember Cathcart? Yeah, so the, and maybe you're going to get here, but the 2.2 the .2 for ongoing, mm -hmm. so is that just the cost of running the courts out of this building, or is that the cost of, of just running the building, regardless of who's there? At this point, it's just the, the court and the prosecution and, and defense out of there. It's a large campus, and that large camp, the entire campus needs to be maintained, right. um, heated, all of that need, needs to continue. Um, there are additional operating costs, such as the security coming into the building, um, and that, that is also a good chunk of that. So can we extrapolate anything from this regarding uh, the cost of running courts in a different facility? Um, the closest we could do it is compare it against, and part of that is in the details of this, is compare it against running. This is in addition to where we currently operate. Okay. Okay. Um, now, I think what, what you're talking about is if we were to operate it in maybe a smaller facility, operate or it somewhere this, else. this facility. Or in this facility, that analysis has not been done. Okay. But definitely could be. Uh, so this is just the for the Primera. So... The, the cost of running the running courts where they are is what? 220000 a year. Okay. And we pay that. So are, is, does that include any kind of rent or anything that we pay to the county? We don't technically pay rent to the county because the building is already paid for. The brick and mortar is paid for. The 220000 that we pay to the county is really for the maintenance and operation. It's for the janitorial. It's for those shared services. 
but, but if, the building's already paid but for. But if we, if the roof needs to be fixed in any particular year, we have to pay our share, not amortized over a 20 year life, but for the year that it gets fixed. I, I would suggest that if that is the case that we negotiate with the county but, on that. But I'm just saying that's how it is now. They yeah. incur an expense, we pay our share. So whatever expenses are coming up, and I think the roof is, at least we hear that it's dripping into our offices already. So that, I'm assuming that's coming. And, and, and that may be, I would, again, I would suggest that we negotiate for a, an annual usage of any capital rather than full board on capital. But that's just my suggestion. Moving to the next. So, really, in this short period of time of 90 days and the studies, um, these are the conclusions from all of that work is that the building is in really good condition. It's, you know, they've taken great care of the building, um, it is in really good condition. Um, it is more space than what the courts need. It is certainly an expansion of the current space that they have and the prosecutions all combined. Um, at the county campus, there is a lot of shared space. Uh, we're only occupying about 8,900 square feet. That is our dedicated space, but we share a lot of space with the county too. Um, so it is at 103 square feet of space and then only 40,000 of usage that came back from Integris, it's still not fully using the space of that facility. And I think we all kind of uh, understood that fairly quickly. Um, and then just on the financial perspective, there is insufficient funding at this time um, to either acquire the building and, and absorb the one-time costs or to operate it. But that's at this time, a lot more work would have to be done um, to make that happen. Could I? Oh, I'm sorry, I, go ahead. I am having a problem with the second bullet because, yes, it's more space than they need, but under their current conditions that are not safe, it's not that they're sharing space, it's the space they have is unsafe, and people are interacting that shouldn't be interacting in an enclosed environment. So I think we need to be careful about twice as much space needed for courts based on current court business model. The current court business model <clears throat> is insufficient and it's dangerous. So I, I just want to be everyone to be aware that that is a little bit, it's not quite accurate. Um, thank you, Councilmember Kinnear. And what is really implied by the current court business model is the face-to-face -face interaction or what are our technological changes in how we deliver services. Courts are different than some services, but at the same time with the pandemic, we've all had to learn to operate and serve customers a little differently. There might be some opportunities um, to take advantage of in terms of technology. In terms of um, safety aspects, um, and I know that Howard has seen uh, the U.S. Marshals uh, report on that that is confidential for security reasons out there. Um, I do, uh, personally, I do believe, I've also read the report, that there are things that we can do to make it safer than the current environment. But some of those items would also have to be applied to the Premier Building or any other facility that the courts, even, even City Hall, any place else that the courts operate, we will have to take safety measures as well. Council Member Wilkerson. So I'm sorry, Jeff, take me back to what will be the ability for courts to expand their capacity in the current location now versus going to the possibly a new location because I hear they have growth issues so what's what's I don't know what their growth issues are I know that what square footage they're currently using the new square footage is more than what they're currently using for the TI improvements okay. so currently they're using approximately 30,000 square feet this is 45,000. <clears throat> we had uh, Councilmember Bingo and then Cathcart. 
Yeah, so um, the safety um, issue, I think, is the one that, that concerns most of us, uh, the, the safety there. Um, $5 million is a lot of money. Is there any way that we could use that $5 million to, um, again, to update whatever space we're currently using to make it, to make it safer and to uh, address the concerns in that U.S. Marshals report? I would say there's a, we could pro obviously do something more, yes. I don't know what that is because I don't know the program. I don't know where the deficiencies are. Howard's my subject matter expert. I'm just going to note, I know I'm going out of order, but the, the primary problem is it's too crammed together, mm -hmm. having been there. The hallways for the court and where the judge is, it's, I mean, you would have to create a lot more space to do it. That's, that's the essence, mm -hmm. my understanding of the safety, is that you are literally rubbing shoulders with people in handcuffs uh, if you're a victim trying to get into the court, the judges are walking out of their door into where everybody is at all the time. So it's, it's just a really constraining place, not through intent or anything else, but it's, it'd be very challenging within the footprint they've allocated us. The solution, if they gave us more space uh, in other parts of the courthouse. We're also in the oldest. We're in the annex so there's a whole big public safety building, which is also old by some standards. But those courtrooms and those hallways and the judges' offices go directly into the courtroom without mixing. You know, that's if we had access to that, but we don't. And there's a restroom problem, too. Oh, restroom problem, too. Okay. Um, Cathcart. Yeah, I, so those same safety concerns, that I think, exist in, in our current jail, and that's part of the conversation on a new jail. But... Given that the county is looking at that and the voters will have their say, if that were to happen, could there be a possibility of, of you know, working something into that new space to accommodate some of these needs um, and remaining on the county campus? I couldn't answer that question because I'm not familiar with the county campus. Okay. Because I just, I'm, I'm wondering, because per uh, Councilmember Bingle's question on, you know, could we improve things now? I mean, I just wonder, five million, as he said, is, is a lot of money and you could, uh, you know, construct something, you could remodel something, and, and I just wonder, from a cost comparison, it would be really helpful to know kind of what is that opportunity cost of moving forward with this or not moving forward, you know, with something else. And, and so it's just, you know, I think this information is great to have, and, and certainly it, it, you know, continues to give me pause based on the finances of it. Um, I, I love the Primera building, but I just don't see how we could afford it. But we have to, I agree with the council president, we have to fix those safety issues. And the same things exist, you know, outside too, uh, the, the parking, you know, for SPD and, and others who are visiting the county campus. That's, you know, very unsafe and causing all kinds of issues. So that needs to be addressed. And I just think there's probably an opportunity for us to work with our partners at the county and figure something out there. But it would just be helpful to have all of that information so we can make all those choices at the same time. I wish I had a better answer for you, but I'm not aware of the safety issues. So, um, Mr. Delaney is here in the back of council chambers. Are you comfortable coming up and sitting closer, Howard, if we have questions or want you to weigh in? I'm not going to make you if you don't want to. Thank you. Um, there you go. Right now, the problem is, as Council President indicates, we're just in too few square feet to be able to make any meaningful changes in terms of pathways. I have been asking for additional space from uh, the county now for 10 years. I've managed to get 100 additional square feet in an office, and I traded for a closet. Uh, that I put an office in. Um, in terms of uh, the building that we're in, one of the major issues with doing anything in the building is the cost imposed by the county. As an example, the closet I put the office in um, had a place with a ceiling fixture, a rectangular just fixture missing. So I finally got them after four years to put a piece of sheetrock over it. So I asked them this year, I'd like to patch that sheetrock in so it doesn't just look like a sheetrock patch in the ceiling, uh, fill the little divots in the walls, 
and paint the only color the county will paint, very near white, right? Current estimate, $2,350. So if you're considering doing anything in that facility, the costs are going to be exorbitant. Um, the, the, the problem I face there is there is no space. I'm number three on the list to get space, which means uh, I will be long retired and I would be surprised if any of you were still um, here working by the time I will end up with priority in the county. Um, the other analysis on the new facility, when Integris did the rework, they put everybody uh, in the criminal justice system in building three, which is just over 40,000 square feet, which means there's an excess of 60,000 square feet in that complex unallocated in the Integris plan. So the cost you're hearing about for maintenance, it, that assumes you're leaving the rest of the facility vacant mm -hmm. if you're attributing them all to the courts. Um, because there's, again, 60,000 additional square feet that's unaccounted for in the Integris work. So, um, again, that assumes you're not going out and looking for third parties to rent or anything. So, that, that's my other comment. Again, I'd be happy to make corrections uh, to the uh, existing space, but there isn't enough space to do any of that, and the costs will be absorbent. I had actually thought about the new jail, and if it makes sense to look at putting additional floors on that, but I, my suggestion is at current construction costs on a per square foot analysis, you can't uh, do a government contract building on that space per square feet, what you could uh, do here. I, I, I defy uh, you to prove that one out. I just don't think it's possible. But Jeff probably knows a lot more about that than I. Michael has so. a question. Just, yeah, for Tanya, have we done the fiscal analysis on the remaining 60,000 square feet? No, we haven't because there's no time to do that okay. um, to meet this 90-day timeline. Um, and, and I think it's been mentioned before, I think actually Matt Boston mentioned it, of we would almost want that to be guaranteed that we're going to have a tenant paying for that space in order to cover the cost for us, the additional 9.4 million and the 2.2 million to operate it. Um, because there is not another funding source for us to, to pay for that. Do you, so the public defender's building, if that were to be sold, I assume the public defenders would then be housed in Primera as, if, if this were yes. all to happen, right? Yes. So do we have an estimate on, on their operating? So their operating is only 60000 a year? That's the entirety? And that includes their, any costs associated with the building, maintenance, et cetera? Just, okay. That is correct. And, but in terms of anything else that we would potentially move in to that building, I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, it would be a department most likely in this building currently, right? And so would we, would we save operating costs if, I mean, obviously the, this building were to remain and we continue operating it, but we just moved a department or a couple departments out to a different facility? Um, yeah, I mean, just, just looking at this right now, um, Council, if we were to move anybody from City Hall or from another city facility, it's not going to save the operating costs here. Okay. We're just moving somebody and it would actually probably hurt us financially if the intent is we need money to pay for this and therefore making it leasable space is the best option, we would want all 60000 to be something that we can lease and make, make revenue. Okay, so I've got Councilmember Kinnear and then Bingle. So two things. First, we as a council at Howard uh, police department has been looking at other spaces for a very long time and they've all been rejected for one reason or another but the fact remains that the courts can't stay where they are does anybody in administration have an alternative to help the situation to fix the situation what's your alternative um, Councilmember Kinnear, that is a great question, and today we do not have an alternative that we can present to you. 
Well, now, is this a high priority? Yeah, it should be. Yes, and yes it is. No different than the police headquarters is a high priority, but we don't have an alternative that we can bring to you today. Most of these items, in fact, you're gonna see in two years, we need two fire stations. Um, one of them, we're gonna lose the fire station. So there are a lot of priorities. The biggest issue is not that it, identifying that it's a need. We, we have clearly heard from Howard, the courts have a very real need that we need to address. Um, they are running out of space. There are safety issues. Um, but it's going to take additional funding, something additional than what we have, or it's going to take us years of accumulating funding in order to, to do that. We don't have years. Um, I, I wonder, Matt Boston is sitting back there. Do, could you, do, would you mind, I'm, I'm not articulating this very well, and perhaps you can speak from a council perspective. And we've got about 10 minutes. <clears throat> um, yes, I can. I, I, I don't um, know exactly what we want it is to answer. I mean, I think I agree with the, um, the assessment is, is uh, are we, are we um, do we have the opportunity to fit a very small or, or a smaller uh, square peg into a round hole? Yes, we can. Um, does that alleviate some of the um, the problems and pressures that are on courts right now, probably yes, probably all of them, but it doesn't um, it doesn't mitigate the uh, the financial constraint that's there on the back end. Meaning, paying for uh, whatever financing it is to build the build or to purchase the building, as well as the operational cost that's there. Um, just like Tanya alluded to or explicitly stated, um, you know, with 60,000 square feet being left over. Uh, we would want somebody to be in that space immediately upon uh, signing of the building. The problem is, is uh, we know that that market right now is tight and there's not a lot of people that are looking for uh, lease space in that area or to purchase. I mean, we've, we've known that Primera is um, up, it's, it's a steal of a purchase and it's still been up uh, for sale for quite some time. So. The market isn't very, very hot there at that point in time. I think there's a lot of opportunity for solutions that we can get to in the immediate. Uh, we know that Integris has a lot of this information. We know that they have the information of um, what the court's need is right now. We know that they have, albeit dated, they have information <clears throat> of uh, what the police headquarters need is right now. We know that they have information on what our current city facilities are right now and the utilization of it. Can they um, merge those different puzzle pieces together to form one puzzle, to form one solution? And I think that's probably what I would suggest for kind of next steps on this. Um, it, it isn't necessarily to rush in to say, okay, let's, let's buy this or nothing. It's okay, let's, now that we have all of this information, let's put it all together to make one, you know, puzzle piece of a solution uh, with, you know, maybe Primera, but maybe other solutions like City Hall and um, the courts facilities as it is now. Can we, get, is there a solution there that we can move offices over here? I don't, I don't know that. I obviously don't know the answer, but Integris has a lot of that information. Um, we know that uh, Primera, just, just from my own um, observation of things, it's, it's not, um, there's, there's, there's no seller to my knowledge clipping at our heels to purchase this. So it, you know, while the, the, um, the feasibility study ends, the period ends next Monday, um, I don't think it's either that or we don't have that option on the horizon at all. I think it's still a possibility if we were to let the feasibility, feasibility period lapse. So it wouldn't be, we could have more time. Right. I mean, you, th there's a couple of options that you could, I think there's a couple of venues or avenues that you can go. One being talk to the Primera sellers and say, hey, we need more time um, to, to look at all of the different pieces of this puzzle or let it lapse, meaning the purchase and sale uh, agreement lapse and say, okay, you know, it's, it, it's technically back up for sale, um, but with there not being a whole lot of interest, uh, we could go down that road and, and do our investigation. And maybe it's not Primera that we find, the Primera uh, facility that we find 
um, that's our solution. Maybe it's, it's a hybrid of something that's Primera and Light Quartz. I, I, I know Howard has been uh, searching high and low for property, as is the city for many years. Um, but, you know, to, to rush into something without having all of the information and all of, especially, I mean, from my perspective, the finances figured out, it makes it very, very difficult. I mean, just like Tanya just said, you know, I mean, we've got, we've got one year of a lease back. That's great. But what do we do after one year? What, what's our next step after that? Um, and, and that's a big what if uh, that we don't have a solution for just quite yet. Okay. Yeah. I see uh, City Administrator Perkins here. Would you like to add in on it? Thank you, Council Member Bingle. Johnny Perkins, City Administrator. I just want to add uh, to Mr. Boston's comments. Uh, the City Administration, Administration of Mayor Woodward has done extensive work in the last two months to bring this forward to you as at your direction. Uh, to give a policy recommendation, but we would ask, we believe that there does need to be more time to the tune of possibly at least 120 days to look at all the things that we're discussing here today. This, the additional safety concerns at the municipal court, are there things we can do with the county? The public defender, their thoughts about moving to Primera, they have thoughts about what that looks like for their operations. What does it look like to fill the 60,000 square feet? Uh, what, what can commercial brokers tell us about the appetite for potential tenants that would come there. What does it look like for uh, another building that is a premier like building in downtown? I've heard from a, a number of commercial realtors, there could be other buildings. I haven't pressed them on it, but I'd like to press them and say, okay, where is that? What would that be and what does that, that look like? So it seems to me this is a very important discussion. This is a very important policy decision and the administration would ask uh, for the council to consider uh, uh, contacting the seller and ask them if they'll allow another 120 days to address some of these issues that you've heard from my colleagues behind me and that you heard from Mr. Boston a few moments ago. Thank you. Can I ask a, just a quick question, and I could be wrong on this. Wasn't there discussion about the police department moving over to that building? I didn't know if it was all of it or portions uh, of it. Yes. Um, uh, Councilman Can you get Cathcart, a little closer to the oh, mic? Sorry. Councilman <laughs> Cathcart early on in the process wondered if there could be economies of scale by relocating the SPD and the rest of criminal justice to a common facility. He'd been aware that the SPD was, had been looking also for space for quite some time. So that's when we partnered with the SPD and talked about uh, uh, being able to co-locate. Uh, the only three facilities that, po that gave us that potential were the uh, print building, for the spokesman downtown right across from the spokesman review building. Um, uh, it, it had a, a, a number of issues because of how the printers <clears throat> sat in the center. Okay. So the remodel costs were quite high and it would have required buying some of the rest of the block to get a number of square feet and actually coming out of ground. We looked at the Chase building uh, which is up for sale. It had a combination of expiring leases and you'd have to manage that. Um, there's only one core elevator system um, which posed some issues because of we had to wait for the tenants to age out. And the third problem is it comes with zero parking. So you'd have to acquire something, uh, either a surface lot or, uh, you mm -hmm. know, make an arrangement with one of the parking garages. Um, and then we looked at two buildings on the Bennett block that are across the street from each other. And we looked at those fairly recently between the cost of acquisition and the age of the building and, and frankly, the cost of remodel combined with the fact, you know, that Premier is full of high-end furniture and things like that already, it just did not make economic sense. But so, it, so if, if the police department looked at the Premier building, is there enough room for them? Um, and if is you there go enough with, parking? Again, if you, sh if you basically, I assume, shrink them uh, on their asks like we did with the court probation public defender, right? They put us all in one building if you shrink them and don't give them a growth horizon, my guess is yes, because there's 60,000 square feet, two full buildings right. available at this point. But uh, if you've, uh, the, the SPD has very specific space concerns and requirements, 
and that's why I think uh, Council Member Kinnear indicates it's been a struggle finding them a location. So. But the parking and but the parking's better, right? There are parking spots at Primera. Oh, oh yeah, it's got a the okay. parking garage. Uh, their biggest question was they had issues getting some of their tactical vehicles in the parking garage, but uh, there's plenty of space you could erect you know, a, a metal building to park the tactical vehicles on there's on the site. That wouldn't be a big issue. Thanks. Okay, who else? Just, um, I appreciate all the work Jeff, you and your team have done under uh, challenging circumstances. And part of the challenge has been a little, in my opinion, uh, less than enthusiasm for some creative solutions to relocate the police, to sell this city hall and move to a different building in downtown for a smaller. There, there was a lot of possibilities that were shut down really by lack of cooperation and challenging within that 90 days. So I think there is opportunity to continue to look at this building. Um, one of the things that we're being judged against the cost is this against no other option other than staying in a, a completely unsafe and unsatisfactory because no one has said if we were going to move to a different building for courts or build it, how much that would cost. My sense is this would be cheaper. So if we are going to solve the problem, this is the cheapest option. And so it's frustrating that we haven't uh, been able to figure out how to get there together on that. And the same with police. It would be so much cheaper to bring police and courts there together as opposed to build the building that they both want on their best day someplace else. So I think it's worth, though, I think we should take the lemons that we have so far and make some lemonade and keep going. And there's, there, are, there are options. If it doesn't, um, if Primera doesn't sell right away, uh, we know the data now. So if we want to rethink and spend the next couple of months coming up with something else, we can. And then the second option, potentially, is uh, somebody else might buy Primera and lease us the one building. Uh, in a long-term lease instead of the other 60,000 feet. And I think that is a, sounds like a realistic possibility as well. Uh, maybe moving courts here. Again, I think this building, we talk about the cost of staying in this building is uh, from the deferred maintenance is huge. So there might be other footprints downtown. I think everybody wants to have City Hall downtown, but who's in that City Hall? How big is it? Where it is? Those are there. So I think I appreciate everyone's work on it. and. We're going to, at uh, briefing today, offer two different um, resolutions, one saying we should go forward and one saying we should um, uh, terminate the agreement so that we get our earnest money back. Um, and I look forward to further discussion. So it's 3 o'clock. One more question. Just real fast. I, I, I agree with the council president in terms of you know, we should have all the information. And so I don't know what the timing looks like for when we'll get the study back on this building. Um, but, you know, I've got lots of questions. I would love to see, you know, what it would look like to potentially put courts in here, what, you know, what the cost might be to do that. Um, and in terms of talking to the county, I'd go over there and, and talk to them with you. I, I, I think it's important that we have those conversations. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I understand they have a lack of space. They have a lot of things going on. But let's, let's at least have the conversation and see what might be doable. Uh, just to close on that is w w we'll have that report, final report on this facility, the 1st of April. Okay. That's why I was suggesting the 120 day extension with the owner to allow us to look at all of these issues that you've raised today and that we've discussed. I don't know why 120 days would be problematic. Maybe, maybe it will with the, the owner. I haven't had those conversations, but that would be our ask as staff of you to consider this afternoon when you're looking at these other items as well. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm just gonna note that we are trying to see if they will, I mean, there's no reason why the administration or the council couldn't try to do that. I think we have a request out to our lawyer who's negotiating to see what they th what they say. Um, Final comments from this group. Council, I just, I just want to, I know Johnny said 1st of April, which is only in a few weeks. Integris, the same people that we're working on are the ones that are doing the utilization study of City Hall. Well, it's those same people that had to get redirected to do this in, in a short period of time. So now they will move back onto the City Hall utilization. So it might be closer to the end of April or the first part of May for us to see the city hall utilization. But we are also going through a process to project out growth for 20 years. The police already occupy more than 60,000 square feet at the public safety building. Police and the courts, um, certainly for police as they're growing, would not fit 
in the Premier campus. It is not a 20-year facility for police and courts combined. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't options, but we're also going through that exercise, and, and I, I know that we want things to move faster than, than they can, but we do need to look out and say, what is it that we truly need over the 20 years as the population grows? And we're working on that as well. So we're trying to bring you the information just as quickly as we can, um, and definitely walk from A to B to C, rather than jump, just jumping to you know, step L. And when we're talking about the police, we need to be talking about a community policing model and not trying to cram people all in the same building. Yes. Because because the community. we're, we're yeah. moving people out into the community. They're not going to need as much space. They're not going to need as much space in a headquarters. They will need more space out in the community. Different conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. But right now, the cop shops are great spaces for them. Tanya, and the neighborhoods can, love it. Can you send the copy of the study, the Primera study that Integris did? Can we get a copy of that too? Yes, um, we can actually even give you just a link to all the file folders with all the studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will meet again um, April 10th at 1.15. Thanks.